thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, this train is leaving on time, obviously, so that's good news, right? We'll try to stay on track. We'll try to uh, keep it uh, food-centric for the most part here. And uh, thank you so very much for inviting us to the stage, the culinary stage, at least for the moment. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to see some old friends and uh, probably meet some new ones as well. Uh, so uh, anyways, I, I've always wanted to, to say this from the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kids of all ages, welcome. I am so sad that the circus train no longer runs, so that's my opportunity to say that, right? So um, anyways, um, today, uh, as you have been told, uh, we're going to uh, provide a culinary demonstration, uh, a dish that has been resonating on the new fall winter menu is salmon. And salmon is a dish that we bring back periodically every 18 to 24 months, basically, because customers ask for it, they want it. That's great news. Uh, obviously, with that limited menu that we have, having interest in every single thing on that menu is really, really critical to uh, our business strategy. But uh, salmon uh, is considered to be the king of fish uh, on board Amtrak. It still really is, and it's uh, obviously very versatile. So we can do all kinds of different things with it. And uh, there are some great health benefits that come along with it. And the good news is, is we do a fairly good job of executing it on board, which is really the litmus test, right? We have to be able to do that. So uh, this season with uh, a salmon filet, we're serving also uh, two choices of sauces. They're scheduled according to a rotation, so you don't necessarily get the choice at the same time. But one is an herb beurre blanc, a white wine butter sauce, and the other uh, is a uh, Thai red curry sauce. And so today, what I'm going to demonstrate for you is a Thai red curry sauce, and I'm also going to um, show you uh, how to cut a salmon. Uh, but uh, before I jump into making the sauce, which is what I'm going to lead off with, uh, I just want to congratulate the organization, NARP, on what you've been able to accomplish and achieve over 50 years. Where did that go, right? Like a bullet. Uh, like a bullet train, maybe. Uh, but, um, it, you know, from an Amtrak perspective, uh, we are so blessed to have you as an advocate untiring, unceasing, relentless, some would say, right? And, and so uh, you've certainly enhanced what we do. Obviously, it's hand in glove. So thank you very much. Congratulations to leadership and to the body of members. You're doing a great job. Yeah. That's worth an applause line. Yes, OK. Uh, so what we're going to do uh, now then, I think, is uh, uh, give you a little bit more information uh, about the sauce. I'm going to focus on that first, and then we'll get into the salmon. Um, so the Thai red curry sauce, uh, and I think that uh, you probably have uh, some recipes on your table. That's a takeaway uh, for those of you who would like it. Uh, it's a relatively simple sauce. I think, as you'll see, uh, I'm going to put it together here. Uh, just going to frame up the context just briefly. Um, it, uh, it utilizes uh, some uh, coconut milk, and you can utilize uh, the full flavored coconut milk, or you can use a light coconut milk. It really depends on uh, you know, what you want to do and if you're counting calories. Both of them certainly work in the context of this recipe. Uh, we also have uh, 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 shallots, ginger, and also garlic. Each of those three items are minced. They're prepared in advance. We see the garlic, we see the shallot, we see ginger over here, and I have my mise en place over here so it's ready to build the sauce. In addition to that, of course, what's critical is to have a Thai red curry paste. That's really the foundation of the flavor in this sauce. It's something that you can buy in just about any supermarket today. Uh, probably one of the brands that you're going to see most prevalently is the Taste of Thai. But if you go to an oriental market, you'll have a lot of different choices. And so uh, we're going to use a little bit of that. In addition, we're going to use a fish sauce. Uh, the fish sauce uh, is basically a fermented anchovy sauce. Uh, it has a lot of umami. And uh, knowing a little bit about cooking, you probably know that umami is one of those sort of mystery elements that we can uh, gr get a great sense of on our palate, on our tongue. Uh, 
Uh, so it's not salty, it's not sweet, it's not sour, it's not bitter, but it's umami. It's a standalone. And so that just gives you this sort of unctuous but also deep level of flavor. And there are a certain number of items like a fish sauce, like a soy sauce, like tomatoes, uh, like mushrooms, those all have elements of umami. And so you'll see lots of chefs incorporating those key ingredients into dishes because it really drives flavor forward. And that's the critical thing that we do as cooks, chefs, of course, is to try to transform ingredients into great flavor. So if you're a vegan, if you're a vegetarian, and uh, you don't, you can't, you won't use the fish sauce because it is a fish base, then you could substitute miso you could substitute a, uh, a mushroom soy sauce. Okay, that would work as well. And you wouldn't really give up that much umami quality. Now, on the shrimp paste, again, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, one of the elements in this is a shrimp, uh, pulverized shrimp paste that's in the body of this uh, red curry paste. It's a key ingredient. So, again, those of you uh, you know, who don't want to have that ingredient, what you would have to do is make your own in-house red curry sauce because it is foundational to basically all curry paste. Uh, and you could Google a recipe for that. Basically, it's toasted coriander and cumin and black pepper. It has galangala, which is a, a, a cousin to ginger. It has uh, lemongrass. Uh, it has uh, dried chili that's been rehydrated. It has fresh bird Thai chilies that are fresh. It's going to have a cilantro in it, typically, uh, and uh, just a couple of other items, including uh, kefir uh, lime leaves, or kefir. And so that's really what that, uh, what that uh, Thai red curry paste is, OK? Anyway, so I just want to kind of walk through the ingredient deck and give you a sense of what we're actually using here. So along with that, a little bit of brown sugar, uh, some scallions, and uh, some salt and pepper to taste and we're pretty much good to go. All right, so we've got an induction unit up here uh, to uh, cook with today. There's also some lime in this dish. So while we heat up this pan, uh, what we're going to do here is um, we're going to cut this lime in half. We're going to juice it. One lime is approximately going to be three tablespoons, although you know, if you have a really hard lime, uh, it might not yield quite that much. You saw me rolling that lime on the cutting surface. What that does is loosens the lime up and allows us to extract as much lime juice as we possibly can. Okay? So that's what we've got there. All right. Set that aside. I'm going to check our temperature here. Okay, so. Uh, on your recipe outline, it kind of walks you through this, but I'm going to walk you through it live and in person. Here we are. So I've got some fish sauce here. I want to get this open. Buy these. Uh, if you're buying fish sauce, they come in large bottles. Don't, don't necessarily, unless you're really going to use it frequently, because a little bit goes a long way. And so... A little bit will go a very long way if you can't get the container open, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, how about that? My wife always accuses me of being a real spaz at home. And uh, she's the one that actually opens most things. How about that? Uh, now you see why. These are the th this is what you get in live television, right? There we go. OK. <laughs> so I think your recipe says we have uh, three tablespoons. I mean, this is really just for a humorous effect. Obviously, I could have opened that container if I wanted to. <laughs> Two and a half, right? Two and a half on your recipe uh, for the fish sauce. OK, so there we go. Uh, that fish sauce does have a fairly fishy aroma, not surprisingly, right, as it's made from fermented anchovy. OK, uh, so we're going to begin the construction of this sauce. I've opened. Um, the uh, can of coconut milk, and uh, you're probably glad that I did that in advance because you just saw me struggle with opening that other container, right? <laughs> so, um, all right, so 
This is the full flavored, the full fatted version of the coconut milk. Our pan is hot. This particular induction unit actually gives you a digital readout of the temperature. You're going to hear a little sizzle, right? Okay, as the coconut milk hits the pan. All right, there we go. I'm going to try to get all of that coconut milk out of there. And I know I'm going to add in a little bit of water to this recipe, probably. But so I'm just swirling around the, co the water in the coconut milk can because what I want to do is extract as much of that uh, coconut goodness out of that can as I can. I paid for it. I want to get value. That's uh, something that we learn at Amtrak ver very early on. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> Contribution margin is everything, OK? All right, so I've got my fish sauce. Uh, I've got my lime juice that you saw me uh, painstakingly squeeze. <laughs> and our, our sauce, uh, our coconut milk is, is warming right now. And so what I'm going to do is introduce some of the other elements. So I'm going to add in uh, the ginger, the garlic, and the shallot, OK? now that our cream is starting to steep. And that's going to start to extract some of those flavors. It's going to soften, um, soften the, uh, take the raw edges off the garlic, off the ginger, and it's going to start to draw that flavor into that liquid, right? That's what we want to do, right? I'm also now going to add the red chili paste, red curry chili paste, OK? And again, Quantities are listed on that recipe that you've got there in front of you. And so, I have a heat uh, proof spatula that I brought along to do this with. Of course, it's in my knife kit bag. So we'll improvise. Try not to melt the spoon you know, into the coconut sauce. It's definitely better without that touch. Yeah. Anyway, all right, so brown sugar going in now as well. And the lime juice, OK? And the fish sauce, OK? Oh, what's so difficult about cooking anyway? I mean, look at this. This is about as easy as it gets, right? So uh, a whisk is also a nice tool to have because that uh, Thai uh, red curry chili paste can tend to be a little bit lumpy and that heat proof spatula really would have been a dream to kind of knock that down. You know, I could go back and get it. It's on my mise en place uh, tray here behind me. But, you know, but Tom has taken the hint and he's going over there. It's in my knife bag, Tom. Thank you. So, see, I'm getting some value out of him too now, right? This is good. <laughs> this is really the first or second time I've ever told him what to do. <laughs> and he's doing it. That's the beautiful thing, you know. A little pressure here, maybe. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so we're going to let this uh, cook. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. That's great. Super. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. He's stealing the show. <laughs> well, that comes later. All right. So, uh, literally, we've got all of our ingredients in that pan. And what we want to do now is simmer it. The only thing we don't have in there are the scallions, OK? So the scallions, I really want them to maintain their integrity, their color, their texture. So those are going to go in at the very end, OK? We've got some salt and pepper here. Um, anytime uh, you're building a sauce, uh, anytime you're uh, cooking, obviously, you want to at one point check or verify the seasoning level. You see that sauce kind of starting to boil there a little bit. And I see there's one lump right there we're going to kind of crush. All right. OK. So just going to simmer this. Now, needless to say, if we reduce this uh, for any application, it's going to become more concentrated. Now, this sauce is being used on dining car service right now, we hope, exclusively with the salmon, but I can't guarantee that. 
Um, who knows if it shows up someplace else? Uh, that's all, always our challenge to some extent, right? But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that this red uh, chili uh, curry sauce uh, goes very well with rice dishes. It goes very well with noodle dishes. It's a great match for pork. Uh, you have seen it on menus with chicken, no doubt. So it's extremely versatile. That, again, that being said, of course, as long as you're not going to cross-pollinate the fish that's in this paste uh, that you have to maybe be aware of, right? So, okay, so we, as you can, is the view pretty good? I think it is. You can see that sauce to some extent, right? Yeah. I, could, I think I have a better view. My monitor is, like, really nice. Oh, that's me. Yeah, okay. Um, we can smell it, though, Chef. Yeah, okay, well, good. Yeah, we should. So I'm going to turn it down now to uh, a simmer. And we're just going to let it go a little while here while we go on to our next uh, phase of the demo. All right. So, Seth, let me take a couple of questions. Yeah, if you sure. Keep going. Is that Absolutely. A good idea? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I can't imagine no anybody in this room has a question, a culinarily based question. Okay. <laughs> Dave Randall. Real quick, are these fully prepared on the trains, or are they prepared in advance and then put out onto the trains? The the sauce is made in advance. Uh, and so it comes to us uh, tested and true and to be exactly what it is we want. And quite obviously, on board, we have some constraints by headcount, ability of onboard uh, service personnel, timing, uh, business demand. So menu development is actually a very uh, dynamic balance of several, several, several different things. And so when we're considering whether to make or whether to buy, whether to customize or whether to buy off the shelf, you know, we're always looking at key elements like packaging. Is it packed right? Is it going to minimize waste? Uh, is it the flavor profile that's going to resonate on board with our customers? Is that what they're looking for? We don't always 100% know that, but obviously the purpose for all of these things being on a train is so that they're going to please our dining public. We think they're going to have some appeal. Certainly in the restaurant world, this is, I won't say ubiquitous, but it's very prevalent out there and it's no longer a scary set of flavors for most people. Uh, is the item that we choose to buy priced right? Okay, do we get that contribution margin as a result of using this sauce versus using another sauce? So all of these trade-offs, all of these considerations are going into that. Long answer to your question. Yes? Keep, keep going there, Chef. So I have special dietary constraints. Yep. Is nutrition information, how do I get nutrition information? Uh, in our dining service guide, and we publish a dining service guide uh, for every service on the long, in the long distance uh, business channel. Uh, and uh, we are increasingly supplying more information about the ingredients in that service guide. But we also list the allergens on every single preparation that is in the dining service guide. Now, the dining service guide, which is also my responsibility, is to compile that, to put that together, uh, you know, so that it can be a vehicle, a tool for onboard service personnel. So it is their job to carry with them a dining service guide. We've gone much more now to uh, electronic versions of the service guide that people have on their smartphones. We also do, you know, hard copies, but it's essential reading. It really is the B-I-B-L-E for onboard service staff. And if they're doing their job, if you ask that question, they should be able to go to that uh, service guide and say, well, here are the allergens that are listed. You know, we have bi big eight allergens, right? So, uh, and to uh, a degree, they're also going to be able to tell you uh, the primary, certainly the primary ingredients that are in that. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, is we're also looking at expanding the information that we give in the future as well. And we're talking now also about uh, having a complete ingredient deck for every dish that we're serving. That's a, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of work. We also publish the service guidelines on how to handle the dish in the service guide, a photo of how it is to be plated. Um, you know, so we, we, this is what we do to support uh, onboard services. Yeah, another long answer. Okay. We're going to wait a second for another question. Okay. Well, very good then. Thanks. All right. So uh, while that sauce is just sort of on a simmering stage, 
uh, we're going to give it a taste here in a, a little bit. Because of the uh, particulates that are in there, that minced shallot, ginger, and garlic, if you really want a smooth sauce, you can burr mix or blend this in a blender, right, if you want something really smooth. If you're folding it into a pasta dish, for example, vermicelli, soba noodles, whatever the case may be, uh, angel hair with vegetables, uh, if you want it a little bit thicker to get that right nap on the sauce, uh, because the other ingredients bring some liquid with it, reduce it a little bit further to concentrate the flavor and also get the right um, texture. One last thing on that sauce, because it's a little bit thinner than I would ideally like it to be. And so what I have, uh, if you look at your uh, recipe, you see something listed as a slurry. Okay, slurry is two ingredients, basically. It's a liquid, a cold liquid, and cornstarch. Okay, so I have about a tablespoon of cornstarch, and I am adding to it three tablespoons, roughly, of cold water. If you add a hot liquid or hot water to this, the cornstarch is going to be lumpy, and it, because it'll start to cook that cornstarch, and it'll form little globulates, and you won't be able to to successfully usually beat that out of it, okay? So you want a smooth sauce, all right? So if I'm finding this is a little bit thin, and I am, I'm adding a little bit of this slurry. Now that four tablespoons of uh, slurry, which is, consists of three tablespoons of water and one tablespoon of cornstarch, you don't have to add all of that. You add as much of it as you like till you get the consistency that you want, okay? And uh, we're going to leave it at that. And if you found out that you added too much by some chance, then what could you do to alter that consistency? Well, you could put a little more coconut milk, but probably just a little bit of water. It wouldn't require much. OK, so there we are. All right. All right. The only thing that we have to add into this are the scallions. And then we want to taste it test it for salt and pepper levels. I go pretty light on the salt usually with this because as we know that uh, fish sauce carries a heavy quotient of salt. We don't want to get too much salt into this. Okay, so, but anyway, that, that is the way that that sauce really should look. We're just going to leave it simmer there a little bit. I'm going to set it aside and now we're going to move on to the second element, which is the salmon. Okay, I have to get dressed for this one. So we, we got our food handler's gloves here. Okay. <laughs> all right, yeah, you can do all kinds of fun things with these, right? Yeah, okay. Leave it to your imagination. Is it still flopping around back there, Chef? What's that? Is it still flopping back there? Uh, you know, it, it, it's not, and it's a good thing it's not, because uh, we don't want to have murder on the Orion Express, right? Uh, so anyway, we do have a special guest, you know, today at this uh, demo, and, and that's my friend Sammy. Sammy uh, really didn't want to come, but. You know, I insisted, and so here he is. And uh, what I want to do today is show you how to cut a whole fish. Uh, and that's going to be interesting because, you know, this tabletop consists of six milk cartons. So let's hope I don't put too much pressure on Sammy on the table. And then, uh, you know, we have uh, an unexpected delay. So um, I did warn the chef that we were actually going to put the whole stage on like an earthquake table and have him move around. <laughs> Yeah, but exactly. He convinced me not to do that. Yeah, yeah. He, you thought better of it. I, I'm, a, you know, I, I'm in favor of that. All right, nobody gets hurt here today. Um, uh, so uh, this is uh, roughly a 12-pound uh, Alaskan salmon. Uh, I'm sorry, Atlantic salmon. Uh, and whenever you see the word Atlantic salmon in the marketplace, uh, you know immediately that it's a farm-raised salmon, okay? Because 
that's where all the Atlantic salmon that's marketed today, uh, that's the source for it, okay? It could be, could be farmed in Norway, like the uh, dining car salmon that we use, okay? That's what our salmon on board looks like. It's a, a center cut, six ounce filet. It's skinned and deep cut, so it has very little fat, uh, fat line on the, on the underside of it. And this is cooked to order on the dining car, okay? So we all know we can go to the store and we can buy salmon filet. Uh, but, you know, in the context of a demo, we want to make this really intimidating and, and hard and difficult for you, so we're going to cut the whole fish, right? <laughs> I don't know how many of you are going to go home and go to your fish market and buy a whole fish and try to, try to cut it. Some of you will, and some of you, I'm sure, have done it. It's really not that hard, and I'm going to uh, try to uh, show you that uh, here in a few minutes. But, as I said, Atlantic salmon, everything you see in the market is going to be uh, farm-raised, uh, you know, whether it's from Sweden, Norway, Maine, Chile, other places around the world. There's a lot of, you know, there's a relative controversy about the sustainability of farmed aqua farm fish. Uh, there are levels of farming, there are different types of farming, so when you say aquacultured fish, it's not just one practice, it's just not one diet. Uh, everybody has got their own take on it out there. But what we do know about it is that it's becoming increasingly better over time. And the American Medal Medical Association has said there is absolutely no danger in eating farmed salmon. Um, they've said some other things as well. But that being said, um, you would have to eat so much farm salmon, and that would be like three times a day, I think, before it could potentially be an issue. Uh, that's what I have read. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, the other type of fish you're going to find out in the marketplace is wild-caught salmon. And virtually all the wild-caught salmon that we have access to in the United States and Canada is from the Pacific Coast. It's Pacific salmon. And whether it's king salmon, which is also called Chinook, uh, or whether it's coho salmon, which is silver salmon, those are the two best salmon. Uh, that you want to look for in the market. And because it's wild caught, uh, you're going to pay more of a premium for it. And of course, as Americans, we have gotten used to having inexpensive food if you compare us to a lot of other places in the world uh, based on our income. We spend a smaller percentage, that's changing, than a lot of other countries do. But uh, anyway, that having been said, these of course are decisions that, you, uh, that we as a consumer have to make. Do I buy wild caught? Uh, do I buy farm-raised fish? Uh, anyway, so, but when you're looking for a whole fish, why would you look for a whole fish if you can buy the filet? Well, maybe you have a, a crowd of people. Uh, maybe you just want to see if you can replicate the salmon cutting you're about to see today without getting cut, as I hope to. Uh, maybe um, you, you, uh, you think you can do more things with it because you can. But one of the, one of the factors that certainly can be said is that this fish versus a filet, you can actually tell whether the fish is fresh, uh, semi-fresh, or old, or beyond old. Uh, and you have to look at the eyes. If the eyes are clear on the fish, if Sammy has clear eyes, that, that's a good tip off, that it's probably relatively fresh. Uh, if, when you put your fingers onto the flesh, it feels relatively firm, like it might not have been two weeks ago since it was in rigor mortis, and, and it doesn't hold that indentation from your finger, it's probably reasonably fresh as well, okay? Uh, does the fish really smell strong? I mean, those of you in the back row, tell me yes or no on that. Those of you on the first, right? So those are the tip-offs, right? And the other tip-off is the gills, okay? So underneath here are the gills, and uh, if those are bright red, you know your fish is very fresh. If the gills are missing, you probably know the fish might be old because the fish market, the fishmonger, wants to sell that fish first. He doesn't want to take a chance on me walking into the joint and asking to see the gills on his fish and, and then wanting to buy something else instead, right? So uh, anyways, uh, th those are some of the things that you want to look for, all right? All right, so here we've got this whole fish. Uh, you ask your fishmonger to scale the fish. Scales are not your friend, okay? You don't want those in your salmon steak. You don't want them in your salmon filet. So let them do the dirty work, uh, you know, at the market, okay? 
Uh, so that's all been taken care of here for Sammy. He's happy about that. You've got to obviously have some knives here to deal with this. The safest knife that you can use is a sharp knife. The duller your knife, the more pressure you put onto it, and if there is a slip, believe me, it won't be an insignificant slip. Okay? You'll be grinding away on that knife to cut through whatever it is you're cut, cutting, whether it's bread, whether it's vegetables, uh, whether it's salmon, uh, whether it's uh, pork loin, whatever the case may be. So try to keep a knife that's in relatively good condition. You know, you can sharpen it yourself. You can uh, buy some tools to sharpen it. You can go on YouTube. Great information on YouTube. You can see a demo on this. You can see a demo on keeping your knife in tip-top shape. When you have a sharp knife, having a steel at a 20-degree angle, that's a steel. That takes these minuscule burrs off the side of the blade on this chef's knife, or French knife, as it's sometimes called. And uh, while we can't really see it with the naked eye, it helps to keep that, to prolong the sharpness of the knife. Okay. When I'm going to cut this salmon, I also need some fish tweezers. Uh, maybe you don't have fish tweezers. These are not my favorite ones. I lost my favorite ones, and I'm not happy about that, but I'll get over it. Um, you can use tweezers from your medicine cabinet, okay? You probably have those, you know. I'd suggest washing them first, but, you know. Uh, and also, um, if you have a kitchen spoon, that's going to come in handy. I'm going to show you why. And uh, your chef's knife is obviously a very sturdy blade. It's a very stiff blade. That's really what you want because we're going to cut through some bone, okay? And then you have maybe another knife that's called a fillet knife. Uh, you can do without it if you need, if you, if you have to. Uh, a bony knife, if you have a meat boning knife, that could work. If you have a, a longer version of a paring knife, or if you're fairly adept at using this, you could use that as well. Of course, outsourcing this is a good idea too because that keeps me in business, okay? All right, so how do we begin? All right, well, some of you are right-handed, some of you are left-handed. I'm going to go with this knife right behind uh, the collar of the fish, and I'm going to point right towards the head at a, a beveled angle. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. And you notice that I'm leaving this first fin on there. And by the way, there are a lot of different ways to cut this fish, but I'm going to show you the simplest way uh, and the safest way. Okay. So now that I've done that, I'm going to crack how is that for timing? You hear that little, the head comes off, okay? So this head, once you remove the gills, can be used in making a fish stock, okay? In Western French-based culinary uh, dogma, you do not use fatty fish to make a fish stock. But the Eastern world, uh, places like the Philippines and Vietnam and places like that and lots of other places, they will use salmon to make a stock. So you can certainly wash, remove the gills, wash very well that head and use some other trimming along with it to make a stock. Okay, now my next cut, I'm going to remove this uh, fin at the very bottom. I'm going to flip it over this fish has obviously been gutted, but actually, uh, if it were not gutted, you could be cutting this fish exactly the same way. You just want to make sure you don't puncture any of those internal organs and create a real mess. You can actually leave the guts in there. Now, this is the belly of the salmon, okay? And this is really prized because this is, has, carries the greatest fat content of any other place on the fish. So you want to take a little bit of time, ideally, to go through and trim this. You can use this salmon then in a stir fry. You can use it in making a salmon burger. Uh, you can make salmon tartare, chopped raw salmon, a little uh, extra virgin olive oil, some chives, some lemon zest, a squeeze of lemon. Delicious. Put it on a crostini. Uh, really, really good eating. We're not going to do that today. We don't have time for that. We'd have to eliminate the rest of the program, right? Um, Bruce wouldn't like that. Uh, so, we've got, we've got it headed, we've got the belly uh, trimmed, and now uh, most people will tell you to make a lengthwise slit across the top of the fish, 
But what I'm going to do is to show you another way. I'm going to start from the head end on this side, and on the other side, I'll start with the tail. Okay, so the object here is to keep this knife completely horizontal, okay? Don't let it start to go up, because guess what? It's going to head to your fingers, okay? You always try to let the knife lead, okay? You can hear, those you can hear the knife going through the bones, maybe, some of you, right? Okay. Should we have Mike Sammy to, so he could tell us what's happening? Yeah. All right, so, so you just saw what I did. We've got a beautiful clean cut across that. Uh, looks pretty good to me. Uh, if I were grading myself, I'd say, yeah, you did good. All right, so you can do it from, you can do it from the tail as well. One of the things you want to do, the way that that knife travels, it's really a great idea to keep your non-knife-holding uh, hand in back of the path that the knife is going to travel to the best of your ability. Because if you should slip, you know, guess what? It's headed to your hand. And, and the other thing I'll say about this, too, is please, don't text, you know, when you're cutting this fish. <laughs> okay? No email. No voicemail messages retrieved. All right, so here you can see. Now, I've... I've, I've cut hundreds of salmon in my career before I came to Amtrak. Uh, used to live on the West Coast. Used to cut and cook lots of Pacific salmon. Got pretty good at it. You do. It's part of your job. All right, so, so now this can go in your fish stock pot, right? Cold water, white wine, uh, a bay leaf, some fresh thyme if you have it, cold water, uh, and then you just bring it to a simmer, you cook it for about 45 minutes. That being said, before we do that, because I work for Amtrak, and I want to get maximum value out of this, I, wanna, I don't want to leave any meat behind here, right? You know, that's what I would do anyway, of course. So I'm t that kitchen spoon I talked about, okay, I'm going from tail Tail to head, okay, you just pull that fish that's on that bone right off of there. And this goes into your salmon burger, your salmon stir fry. It goes into your scrambled eggs and salmon. Um, <clears throat> it goes into any number of things that you want to do with it. So that's what we have left, not too much, right? So we're going to put that over there in the circular file. Can we take not, another question there, Chef, while you're uh, up there? Stock? Yeah, sure. Let's take one. I, we know that you're under a tremendous amount of pressure, both respecting cost and also what you can do with the staff and the number of people you have to serve. Yeah. So I wanted to compliment you on what I think is a remarkable improvement in some of the food services on Amtrak where you do not have the time for full prep. I had dinner on the lake shore two days ago coming out from Albany, and although obviously that is not a fully cooked on board menu, it was remarkable. Yeah. When you're looking at concocting those kinds of entrees, which you can do with a smaller number of people, but still making them come out and seem like really good food, do you turn to a Cisco or a company like that that can serve you uh, completely prepared entrees, or do you guys design them and then have someone custom make them up for you? How do you do that? For though, that's a good question, and I, I will take the compliment as well. I appreciate that, because these one-off services where the equipment looks different and where the staffing model is different are indeed really challenges to design for. And oftentimes, there aren't market-ready solutions just waiting for us to call and say, hey, send me this. You know, The fact of the matter is, there are, and we always look for that. Uh, but we find, because of some of the things that I said earlier, uh, we invariably uh, have to do a certain amount of customization. Uh, and so we right now have, I would say, four prime partners that uh, we are able to leverage. And we, we brought, actually, we have five. I brought two new ones on board this year. And I'm really excited about their capabilities, their price points. Uh, we're really getting some great traction in some of these custom design meal kits. Uh, the meal kits can take some different formats. They could be a, um, 
They could be a tray um, such as this, okay, that has the single components that are heated and then plated, each component separately onto the uh, plate so that you get a great presentation. Or it could be something like a uh, risotto or it could be a pasta where everything is just in that tray. You heat it and you basically slide it out onto the uh, entree plate for a nice presentation, okay? Um, so, uh, but designing those kind of meals where you have limited ability, uh, much more limited ability in terms of staffing, but also in terms of the equipment itself, like the Lakeshore Limited, <laughs> that uses, uh, you know, diner light equipment, uh, that is a big challenge. And so, as a result, of not only working with staff, but also finding some products that we can build from the ground up, that can be, uh, that has really proven to be very helpful and very beneficial, and we're going to have to continue to do that. Now back to this salmon here, uh, hopefully that answered your question. There are pin bones in this salmon, okay? And if you run your hand from the collar to the back, you're going you're gonna to raise those bones up a little bit, you know, there's anywhere from 15 to 20 of them in there. That's where these tweezers come in. Okay. And you can really feel them. I'm just pulling each and every one of them now. We don't want any, this should be boneless salmon filet after all, right? Don't want to hide a, hide a bone in there and have it, have it go down the wrong pipe. Okay, uh, maybe two more bones. Yeah, no. So, 23 bones. Okay. All right. So, okay, we want to get finished up here. And, um, yes, my sheet pan. Excuse me one moment while I move this other fillet to the back. We'll finish up in cutting this. Now the salmon skin, since it's been, uh, since the scales have been removed, are um, something that you could put on the grill, something you could put in the oven. Uh, it's, you know, because it's been scaled, uh, it's, it is something that you can leave attached. And it does help to keep the salmon together, without a doubt. But lots of times you're going to want to remove that skin. Uh, I, like to, I like the flavor of crispy salmon skin myself. And one of the things I love to do with the salmon skin once it's been removed, or if it's on the filet, if you really crisp the skin side down in your pan, you can get a nice crisp on it. But you can lay that skin once it's removed from the fish also and put it between two pieces of parchment paper that have been sprayed with, uh, say, a Vegeline, and then put it in an oven, and you're going to get, like, uh, you know, uh, a crispy salmon skin. So what I'm doing here is kind of a sawing motion uh, on this skin. I am keeping that salmon filet taut, keeping some pressure on it, and just making my way through the entire filet on that side. And so here's what we have. This could be washed and it could be treated as I said. So here's what we have. We have a skinless, boneless salmon filet. And uh, so then we have the portioning of this fish. Lots of times you may prefer to give a bias cut because the bias cut being at that angle gives you greater plate coverage. That's a restaurant trick, of course, to make it look as though it's bigger than it is. Yeah. It's huge, as somebody famously once said. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I can say about that. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do now, we have, I think, just enough time and to still get into the station on time, we're going to uh, get another pan on here. We're going to turn up the temp, and uh, we'll do a little serration of the fish. Now, at its widest point, you know, uh, you can split that salmon down the middle and cut a five-ounce 
piece. Um, I could have cut steaks out of this fish. This fish is just the right size to cut steaks out of as well. Well, this is fun. Cutting every piece a different size. That was totally against the rules. Of course, they've got to be uniform. Anyway, so, all right. Any other questions before we get into the searing? Yeah. I can hear you. Charming, right? But it makes me wonder how you deal with customer complaints both on board and later. Well, Tom, I'm going to ask for some help on this really tough question. <laughs> well, I'll start. Yeah. I haven't been in the hospitality business my whole career, as many of you know. Yeah. We never had customer complaints in any of the restaurants I worked at. <laughs> it's fake news. Yeah. Fake news. There we go back. Right. It's huge fake news. One of the things we have to do is just have an unrelentless focus on the customer, right? And to up our game, make sure that we're doing everything that we possibly can to, to meet uh, their wants, needs, and expectations. Uh, with food, it, it's difficult sometimes because we all eat. We all have our own different tastes. Um, and so uh, sometimes it's difficult to meet that need, but uh, we do absolutely the very best that we can as far as Daniel and his team of making sure that our chefs on board um, understand, as he said earlier, the service guide and the techniques that they're supposed to use to prepare the foods properly. That, uh, the quality of some of the foods that Daniel and his team put together, I think, are absolutely the best. Uh, but it really comes down to execution, and, and we're working to get better at that and get more consistent at that. We have this uh, room in most of the commissaries where we lock these people up for a couple of days, and then, you know, we let them out, and they're better. No, that's not true. <laughs> that's a joke. All right, we're waiting for the uh, pan to get uh, hot here, and let's check the temp. Take one more question from the audience. There was some... Roger Clark, you're the lucky last winner. Okay, we went through this a few years ago, but oh, yeah, yeah. you guys we, have we some can, really yeah. good Thank desserts you. That's good, on Tom, board. Yeah. But the one thing that you've been lacking is ice cream. And uh, almost all the people on board, or all the attendants say that they get a lot of requests for ice cream. Why is that such a problem? Uh, it was a really difficult decision to remove the ice cream uh, from the, uh, you know, from our provisioning list. And, uh, you know, the, the basic reason we did it is we're not bad people. We're not mean people. We want to give people what they want. But the reality is, is that for like 44 years, we've, we've been serving oftentimes an inferior product. Um, and we have a lot of waste related to ice cream. It's related to temperature. It's related to the ice cream often thawing and then being refrozen. Uh, and then so that product is really compromised. And uh, we have, through the years, gotten lots of comments on that uh, in doing an analysis of spend uh, versus uh, revenue. Uh, we routinely have thrown away a lot of product in the warehouse because we had seen uh, that it had thawed uh, to a degree, then refrozen, and sometimes this happens multiple times, as you might imagine, on board. And so that was really the decision, a tough decision that we had to make. And so at, when we did that, we expanded the dessert offering to include a signature dessert. We had hoped that that would help to, you know, take people's vision away a little bit from the ice cream. We understand, we get it. Uh, but it's just one of those things that we finally had to admit to ourselves. you know what, we just can't do a good job in getting this to the passenger uh, uniformly, consistently, uh, as we really should. And that's really the, the simple truth. Will it come back at some point? I don't know. Before we took it off of uh, dining cars, uh, we did try another product. Um, 
you know, that's um, designed to be a very slow melt and that it's actually a product we do use on the auto train with fairly good success, but because of the nature of the auto train, there's greater ability to control that product and not to let it get out of the temperature zone that it needs to stay in. That, remember, that's all captured equipment there, and that really is beneficial. If we had that every place, I bet you we would have ice cream on board again. Yeah. So Daniel, uh, while you finish up uh, yep. steering that salmon for us, what we're going to do is uh, have the staff start bringing out a sample for everyone yep. of the dish that Daniel uh, prepared for you today. So it won't be a full-size entree, but it'll be a small sampling so you can taste every component of the dish as it would be served to you on board the train. So they're bringing that in now while Daniel finishes up here. And uh, so this is, the, this is the dish that you're not going to get because <laughs> it's too big for you. You're probably not hungry after, you know, watching all of this, right? You're going to get a smaller version, okay? And then there's lunch after that. But this, this is the way, by the way, it should look when it comes to you on the dining car. Now, typically, you know, there should be a parsley garnish. There should be a lemon wedge. Uh, we do actually ask folks, and most of the chefs are doing this uh, pretty routinely, to serve the sauce on the side so that the customer can actually add as much or as little sauce to it as they would like. Uh, and of course, that varies to some extent. And then we have uh, two new components that are in the menu mix for the fall winter season, which uh, is a wild rice, wild and white rice medley, and then also some petite green beans, uh, haricot vert, the French call them. And that's really what the dish should look like.